thank you all for checking out this week's episode. Once again, I'm John. If you like what you heard and saw today, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And check out our brand new merch store with hats, coffee mugs, t-shirts, other cool stuff coming down the pipeline. Again, thank you all for support. Be safe and see you next week. How's it going, everyone? John here, the host of Spirit Talk. And today we're welcoming the incredible Nicholas Vince here. Uh, besides being a director, a poet, artist, podcast host on the Chattering Hour, uh, his roles uh, with his prolific work with the legendary Clad Barker as the Chatterer in Hellraiser 1 and 2 and Kinski and Nightbreed, uh, two reasons why I grew in love with horror growing up as a kid and two reasons why I was kind of contemplating if I wanted to enjoy this type of genre. So, uh, Nicholas, it's great to have you on here. Thank you very much indeed, John. It, I, it's always amazing me when people say the incredible Nicholas Vince and I'm thinking, yeah, really? <laughs> well, it's one of those things, too, where it's like, and I do want to talk about this. You spent some of your most legendary roles have been under this crazy amount of makeup. Mm. Uh, so it's so funny to see you now. And then obviously we're going to talk about your one man show, I Am Monsters, where mm. it's you out there in your flesh just literally being yourself doing this stuff. So it's it's really cool to see kind of the face behind all these makeups and costumes and stuff like that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think, well, yes, I'm, I'm happy to talk about I Am Monsters because um, we just announced something pretty special concerning that, which I think you are the first official person that I have spoken to about the new project. So, yeah, I'll look well, forward to talking about that. Let's kind of jump into it because I know and I don't, I try not to date these episodes because of the pandemic and stuff. And I like to talk about stuff that's always everlasting but sure from a creative standpoint on your end obviously your life was affected um specifically your one-man show you do and i know you were trying to do stuff with conventions and hopefully that starts up again but the idea of the pandemic from a creative standpoint did that inspire you more or at the beginning were you kind of like man how what 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 am i going to do now that's really interesting. I think, okay, so I, I, the first thing I wanted to do was not do anything with horror because I just thought, oh my God, the world is such a horrible place and it's, it's really not good out there. Let me see if I can try doing something humorous. And I started, I put together these things called Life of a Dog and just tried a few cartoons. Um, and just as I was about to launch that properly, then my manager, Chris Rowe, invited me to host the chattering app and then of course you know this was a complete swerve and took over my life for most about the last year and a half um I, and i am so grateful because i got to speak to so many different people i mean we kicked off with malcolm mcdowell yeah which is one you know just so much fun but i got to speak to some really really, really interesting people so to answer your question more precisely yeah i think as is so true in most of life, my life, if not other people's, I suspect. Just when you think you've got it all sorted out, you know exactly what's going on, something else comes along. And yeah, so I think initial reaction was, oh, I couldn't really imagine writing horror. And then did the along came the chattering hour, and I got to speak to so many, as I say, inspiring people like Lynn Shea, Malcolm McDowell, um, Darren Lynn Bowsman, and all these amazing people. And that kind of like, oh, actually, yeah, I, I remember why horror is important. I don't know if you saw, I think it was a university in New York that pointed out the fact that people who enjoyed horror were doing better in the pandemic than people who didn't. Yes because we're just basically we're very used to facing our fears and dealing with uncertain situations and going through that kind of stuff so i, I did write a short story um for a anthology that was supposed to come out at the end of last year i think is coming out at the end of this year so i did do some horror writing i did do the you know the shows um and but yeah Immediate reaction was, oh, my God, this is just horrible. <laughs> Your uh, The episode with Lynn Shea was amazing because obviously I'm familiar with her work, you know, like with Insidious and James Wan and like this kind of late career resurgence she had in this genre. But it was 
what I, what I found doing my stuff, talk to people like yourself or Kate Hodder or some of these other people in horror, they're, they're so interesting because they play some of these most vile characters or misunderstood characters, scary creatures, monsters, beasts, wherever they are. But underneath that, it's like the human aspect that they bring to those type of characters. That's kind of what seeps through. And I, just talking to you now with the first five minutes, I'm like, man, this guy played the chatterer and here he is talking so eloquently. And it's it just, for me, it's just so fascinating that someone like Lynn or yourself can become these type of characters very outside their norm. Yeah, I think it is interesting, isn't it? Lynn Shea particularly, I thought her observation on what it is to be an actor and the fact that she talked about when you're on film, it's the job of the director and everybody else to create a safe space to tell the truth. And I thought that was a particularly profound insight into what being an actor is about and really what, as artists, we're all trying to do. Um, really, I was just watching, we got a thing over here called Britain's Got Talent. I'm sure you've got America's yes. Got Talent. So I was just watching a clip earlier on this evening. Um, I should put this in a little bit of context. I live in a town just outside London called Croydon. And David Bowie was really uncomplimentary about Croydon because he went to art school here and he said, you know, if you want to describe the worst of anything, it's so fucking Croydon. And I've always thought, you know what, I want to... I really think there's an awful lot going on in Croydon. And I think it's so fucking Croydon. It's so excellent. And there was a young lad, he's 22 years old. He's doing an audition with a 17 year old. He's a rapper. Uh, he's just, he's literally just met on that day, the 17 year old pianist. They'd been during pandemic, we're talking over Instagram and they were, put together this song, they got the golden buzzer, they're through to the semi-final after, and what he did was rap about his life. He rapped about how he was not a good boy, how he made some really bad mistakes, and he really wanted to tell his brothers, don't do what I did. And I think this is something that, now that's obviously musical and it's wonderful, and I just found it very inspiring, but I think in horror, we, go to the dark side and we explore the dark side. We explore, you know, horror is about love, death, sex, and starshine. Sex, love, yeah, it's a quote Clive yes. Barker, short story. It's about finding out those parts of ourselves that we really don't want to acknowledge. It's about asking questions about what happens after death. It's about wanting to be immortal and suddenly thinking about Frankenstein and, and yep. reanimation and, and so on. And I think that that is his thing to do with Lynn Shea is about, and this is why I do think horror is important, is that it gives us a safe space in which to explore these things and find out. And I think that's important for us as human beings. If you believe utterly that you are nothing but good, you're not a human being as far as I'm concerned. Right. But, you know. The confidence it takes for you to start up the I Am Monsters, this one man show you do, it's just you on stage. Like there's no mm. elaborate costume and stuff. Is it difficult for you to jump into those characters where visually you're kind of like, am I doing this right? Like what kind of confidence oh. do you have to have to kind of be, portray yourself with this man? Because it's for someone to put themselves out there like this, so I, I would believe that if I look at it, but if I, if I had other actors with me or makeup, I could kind of hide in the scene mm. or whatever, mm. but this is just you raw in the flesh. So what's that kind of like that thought process when you start to put this together? Terrifying. No, no really, really, really scary. Because what I did, what has just happened has just been announced uh, um, is that I am going to be filming the show. Uh, and in fact, later on this evening, I've got a production meeting where we're going to decide the dates of the filming. I'm going to be working with the guys who did a film that I was part of called Book of Monsters. Uh, it's Jared and Paul, and I'm really looking forward to it. And, it, and it's, 
okay, it was two things that happened. A, I looked at the script again, uh, because when I wrote the script, it was a running time of just under the hour. Now to make that into a feature at length film, you know, that has to be over 84 minutes. Then I had to look at the material again. And actually, as I was, oh, I'd forgotten I'd left that bit out. I'd forgotten I'd left that bit out in trying to, because it's so you now get to know an awful lot more about my story. And yeah, it's terrifying. It's very emotional. I was looking at the script the other day. And I thought, I don't want to look at this again for at least a day or two because this is upsetting because I'm talking about some very difficult and painful parts of my life. I mean, I don't want people to go away and think, oh God, it's just miserable or it's Nick just whinging on. It's not. It's about what I have learned about myself and what it, you know, monsters is such an emotive term. It's such a... Yeah, and I've portrayed monsters. Chatra is, I know, is really, really scary for people. Kinski and Nightbreed, the third, you know, the third film I did with Clive, is a completely different type of a monster. I think you, hopefully, in fact, I know the audience has huge sympathy for this guy who's got the most extraordinary face, and for all the other monsters in media. So. Yeah, I've forgotten the original. Oh, what is it like to do? It's terrifying. It's just scary, really. I, and terror can be debilitating. You can either freeze, panic, um, which means that you just seize up and can't do anything, or it can be exciting. And it, it's just like, it's scary. But it's like being on the roller coaster. You do it because you, you know, you want that thrill of going, I know I'm safe, but oh God, this is, I can't look. And I think in doing I Am Monsters, that's one of the things I wanted to explore is what my experience has been, how I've dealt with my fears, what I've got, what I went through physically um, in my life in order to get to where I am today and so on. And also, but looking at the fact that I was a gay man in the 1980s, not a good time. Right. To be, you know, really not a good time. Um, and to deal with, and, and I think it's the fact that, of course, you, as I'm sure everybody else, we, we talked about not talking about politics, but it's very easy for people who want to make the victims of people who are powerless, but who appear scary. It's that weird contradiction in terms. Right. Many, and it's usually refugees. We've got a lot of politicians all over the world. It's yes. a really easy group to victimize because they are not us. And it, again, I Am Monsters is about exploring them the other, the not us. So those are things I think are, you know, kind of important. I think we always need to be, we always need to be aware of how we are behaving and acting towards other people. There's a, I kind of want to talk about that. Being a gay man in the 1980s, mm. the, the idea that you had to hide yourself, you couldn't truly be yourself because you're not going to get work. You're not going to get this. Mm. There's a, there could be a girl or a guy today who listens to this, when this episode airs that is in the same shoes as you. Now, hopefully we've moved ahead as a people where more understanding, but mm. what advice do you give to that guy or girl that is, could be gay, but truly is a creative a mind like yourself, but is scared to truly be himself. What advice do you have to though that that person that be like, hey, just be yourself and don't let this stymie your creative output when you want to give to the earth? Find other people, I think, is a good thing to do. I didn't. Um, it took me a long time to realize how important that was. And I think I suffered more than I needed to because of that. Um, I, 
think finding other people, find other weirdos. Yeah. But this is why I love horror. You know, the people who, the fans of horror, the people who I meet at convention, conventions, I don't, when I say weirdos, I, I don't mean that in any form disparagingly, but find people are slightly out there who just are, who don't fit with the norms and just acknowledge, listen, I get it. I think if you're a teenager, if you're at school, you want to fit in. Uh, I remember talking to Clive about this um, back in the 90s, and he was saying, you know, tribes trouble with human beings is we all want to belong to tribes which is both good and bad you get a lot of support from a tribe but the trouble is if you then believe that your tribe is better than everybody else's tribe then you try and dominate and then you try and disparage it etc and then then you start getting conflict that's not good so my advice is listen it's your journey I do not know, and I cannot know your anybody's circumstance. But there are some simple self-evident truths. You have to find courage somewhere inside yourself. And at some point, you are going to have to say, in the immortal words of the song, I am what I am. Um, that's tremendously freeing. It, But it takes a huge amount of courage. And I think it is just a question of how secure you feel and how much support you get from your family um i, I, I have wonderful nephews and nieces and i'm thinking of one in particular um who's not gay he's straight um but cheerfully went into school one day dressed um <laughs> superbly inappropriately for a boy and it's just like good on you mate you just had the courage to go and do that you're just like that's what i want to you know that's what i'm right. gonna i admire people like that so yeah i think it's yeah the piece of advice is find other people see seek help if you're suffering seek help if you there are lots of people you can talk to talking really helps lots of helplines lots of people who really do want to just help you and will listen um i think that's what's really important is that having somebody to listen to you, not tell you how to live your life, how to solve your problem, but just having somebody to listen to can be tremendously helpful. What, my, the reason why I fell in horror movies, my uncle, uh, Tommy, and I don't talk about this a lot. Uh, he died in 96 of AIDS. And this was a, he came, my dad's brother from a Italian family where that generation, uh, on paper, it was perceived that they would not understand, like, what are you doing? Like, all this stuff. It wasn't the case. Very supportive and stuff like that. But he was the reason why I got into love. He, he stuck me into watch all the R-rated horror movies. Uh, it just, I, I fell in love with the idea of fantasy, thriller, horror, all because of him. And one of the first movies we watched together, and this is late night, was Nightbreed. And before he passed away, as I was younger, I was kind of like, I just love this. There's monsters, there's, there's characters. It's it's just awesome. Like, it's this new world. It's awesome. He passes away in 96, and I get older, and I still watch this movie twice a year. And it wasn't until a couple of years ago I watched it, and I, I just sat back and go, man, like, I understand now where I look, perceive this film as people that look at these people that are monsters, whether now back in the 80s, being gay you're considered a monster or mm. you're not mm. human and the social commentary in a film like that as i got older i realized man this is a perfect like it's almost like the yin and the yang to what was going on at the time to sure you could they look kinski looks different he's got the big chin and the crazy mm. face but he's no different than nicholas vince who's a normal human being who's a gay man mm. or my uncle and it's like it's just so unique and cool to me that a film at that time coming from a mind like Clive's is it just makes you think as you get older. And I think that that's the power to his films and the role you did in that movie where it's just like, we're all monsters. It's just accept people for being different monsters. And I, again, I, I can't thank you enough for that role, like how it kind of helped me really just fall in love with horror. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I, it, it is interesting. I mean, I had a number of people come up to me over the years and just say, as people who are gay or 
somewhere else on that. I mean, we're talking about people who are gay, and, and I think when I use the term gay, I mean LGBTQIA+. Yeah. Anybody anywhere on that spectrum, including straight people. Right. Um, because you're all part of the same family as far as I'm concerned. But I, I do, you know, it's where I think it was inspirational for people because A, the monsters are the good guys. It's very right. clear that the, the bad guys, the monsters in the film are the religious bigots, yeah. the guys with the guns, the intolerant ones. They're the real monsters or, you know, the, the or Chenard, the wonderful David Cronenberg yes. <laughs> um, playing Ch Chenard. But it, it's Eigerman and, and the Sons of the Free. Uh, you know, those guys are the real monsters, um, as far as I'm concerned, because, you know, everybody in Midian just actually just wants, they've taken themselves away. They're not harming anybody. They're not, you know, they... It's not like they go out and rampage local right. villages or anything. They really do stick until Boone comes along and Laurie and bring all that attention on them. They're really just living this very quiet life amongst themselves. And anybody who is a monster is welcome there. And I think people have said that they you know, really enjoyed it and identified it and found a lot of courage in that. How important is it the idea of trust when it comes to work with somebody like Clive Barker? There is a sense mm. he knows, and like if you could kind of talk about how you guys met, because I think it's super fascinating um, how you kept in touch and that he offered you the first role in Hellraiser. But when it comes to working with someone like Clive, there has to be a trust or that connection where it's like he's not going to put you in a bad place to succeed. You're going to do your best to make him succeed. It's like you have that kind of unique way of just putting it all together and really trust each other to pull us off. Yeah. I think that has a lot to do with the friendship um, in my case and Doug and Simon Bamford. Um, and in the first movie, Grace, who was Clive's cousin. I think that a lot of you know, that helps a lot, but of course the rest of the crew weren't Clive's mates when, you know, he managed to assemble an amazing class cast player Higgins uh, Andrew Robinson um, and and the backstage guy you know, Robin Vigeon, who was the cinematro cinematographer. This comes back, a, I think, a, one of your earlier questions about art and being gay and being different and believing in yourself. I think the thing again, going back to cliche, telling truth, the safe space to tell truth as artists. Our duty is to tell our truth. Now, I'm making the distinction between the truth and our truth, because our perspective on the world as a human being is completely different. I was watching something the other day, you're saying, you know, you are unique. If you look at the fantastic coincidences and happenstances that came together to create you as a human being, in terms of your parents meeting, their grandparents meeting, their great great grandparents meeting, and so on, you know, right back until the early right. dawn of humanity. It is extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary, that you and I exist as we are, and we are totally and utterly unique. Now, problem is with human beings, we do like to put things into boxes and categorize them to help us understand things and i think this is one of the you're talking about trust and, and creativity i think because clive was wonderful at creating a safe space in order to tell truth right. as, as lynn mentioned i think that this is what why one of the reasons why hellraiser worked because he managed to get a whole load of talented talented people i'm thinking now that image animation as well oh, the guys okay. who actually physically created the makeup and gave them permission to experiment and have fun and try out ideas and you know always talk to clive about your idea and just say not happy about this I, I, it's not i don't understand it and that's an okay thing to say 
as an actor is just say, you know, it's, I was, remember watching, going back to Malcolm McDowell, I was in Los Angeles a few years ago and he was being interviewed by Gary Oldman before a nice. screening of Clockwork Orange. I'm talking about acting with Kubrick um, in Malcolm's case and um, Coppola in Gary Oldman's case. And it's just saying, yeah, these directors just expect you to know your job and to get on and do, you know, they don't want to give you direction. I was listening to Debbie Reynolds being interviewed the other day when she was working with Alfred Hitchcock. She was getting really wound up because he wasn't giving her direction. You know, then she had a chat with him and she said, my dear, I only give you a direction if I think I need to. Really bad Alfred Hitchcock impression there. Um, and I think that is part of the fun of being an actor is that if you feel safe, uh, it takes courage again. You have to overcome. Again, going back to what's it like about laying my life bare on stage. I remember, I'll never forget that first night standing backstage and just thinking, oh my God, what have I done now? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what have I done now? Um, what mess have I got myself into now? I mean, I was really lucky. There was always really great. I remember walking onto stage to applause. That always helps. If you walk on stage and people are already applauding, that really helps to settle the nerves. It's like, oh, I'm amongst friends. And actually, one of the great things about doing a one man show is. It was a fairly small audience, it, deliberately a small auditorium that I was um, speaking to so that I could see, and we lit it so that I could see the audience. They weren't in darkness. I could half light. I couldn't necessarily, I could see my friends on the front row passing a bottle of champagne between the two of them. Yeah. As friends do. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was that kind of show. It was that kind of atmosphere. Um, but you get a sense of the audience, and, and I just realized, yeah, actually, no, the one. I'm going to tell the. I'm going to tell these stories as if I'm just telling it to friends. It's obviously there's a. We mic'd me and and made sure that I could be heard, so that I didn't have to project too much because then it becomes a performance, rather. And when you're dealing with your own life, I mean, there is a performance, and in fact, part of the show has got performance of three characters readings um in the original version from uh three books which i'm not going to attempt to name off the top of my head because oh actually no i can i can think i can get all three dracula uh island of dr moreau and the phantom of the opera that's different because that i was definitely reading you know then i was right. definitely portraying a character to kind of explore how other creators have looked at what a monster is and people's reactions to them. I've had uh, Thomas G. Waits on the show, the actor, and he talked a lot about the, some of the stage stuff he does, the big bath with Pacino on Broadway and a bunch of these off-Broadway things he would do. And it, what got me really interested about it, you kind of just hinted about it, is when you go out there one night, the audience is going to react differently to a uh, maybe a, a the way you say a line or the humor or the not humor so as you go out the second night for you, the, your type of show you do you you have to, uh, it's, to kind of talk with your mindset because you have to what you think is funny in the crowd last one night could be like silence the next night and how do you how do you kind of navigate through that as how easy is it for you to kind of read a crowd or read a room where it's like mm. you know how the show is going to go that's a really interesting question. Um, that really is, to use a phrase that one of my old managers used, cock on the block time. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, I yeah, that. That, <laughs> I know. It's just like, yeah, time to put your cock on the block. You can do this or you're not going to do it. You, you, you just have to go for it. Sometimes you mistime it and you think, oh, that was my fault. 
sometimes it just doesn't land and you you dealt with science i think it's understanding you're never going to get it a hundred percent every night there is a wonderful story there was a great british actor called laurence olivier oh back in the 19 oh god his career starts in the 1930s yeah. through tone yeah right up until the jazz singer um neil diamond and he you know amazing oh a, a marathon man uh opposite dustin hoffman amazing yeah, actor he did I mean, in the days when people used to black up to play Othello. He played Shakespeare's Othello, and it was a tour de force, and everyone loved it. And he was a very declamatory actor. You know, he was from the old school. He was a big, did this most amazing performance, and it was John Gilgood who was in it with him. So that he came off. Olivia came off stage one night and just look shattered after what was probably the most brilliant performance he'd done. He, he, he had soared that night. And Kilgood said, what's wrong? That was brilliant. And what is the matter, Larry? And he just said, I can't remember how I did it. I don't know how I did it. And I think it, this alludes to what you're talking about. It's a two-way street. When you are performing in front of a live audience, it is very much about who is in the audience and how, therefore how comfortable you feel and what's going on in the audience and therefore what bits you think. And I, it's almost like to telepathy because I think there's an awful lot more going on in the communication between an actor and an audience just like me standing up on stage and so on and the rest. there is a kind of a magic there um, and it's you just get used to it and you just hope and you just you cast your bar yeah it's cock on the block about time basically <laughs> What I love about art, all aspects of art, the idea that it can be visceral, uh, it can it can make a point, it can make you think. And I love that whether it's a a vulgar line or a very dark poem or a a movie like Hellraiser that's visceral and violent, I, I love the idea that it pushes the boundary of art. And I think that art sometimes mm. there is so much censorship nowadays when it comes to art. Now I'm not talking about if there's artists that is uh, doing racist or homophobic, like there's no place for that, but art that like the good art we're talking about, do you feel that we're getting to a point in our lives where just because you might not understand the art or get it, that there are people trying to censor art or trying to ban that book because it's, it makes you think differently or paintings and stuff like that. Yes, there are. Funnily enough, again, locally, I was just been reading articles about, um, <laughs> they invited in an author who was a uh, young adult author into a Catholic school. His books happen to include gay people. I don't think they're even the central characters but there's obviously a very humane treating and, and positive support of gay characters in this book. And the archdiocese, diocese, archdiocese, um, I really don't understand how the Catholic Church is organized, so I'm not sure if it's a bishop or whoever it was, but basically they said, no, you can't have this guy in, to which the governors said, no, it's important. We know that we, have, it's important that our children get to understand this. I mean, a couple of schools recently for various reasons and I was amazed to see on the corridor, in the corridors of um, schools with like 16 year olds, positive posters for gay people. And again, the, the whole rainbow spectrum. No, I mean, this, I mean, literally we've got, um, governors being sacked, teachers going on strike, governors being replaced, uh, parents going on strike, parents accusing 
the school of wanting to teach porn, saying our kids must be protected. I think this is one yes. of the most horrible. You know, it seems that you're absolutely right. There, for every step we seem to take forward, there seems to be an you know, and actually it does appear to be pendulums. The more you push the pendulum in terms of acceptance, the harder the those who would not accept push back. And I'm, I'm sure it's based on fear and misunderstanding in all these things. So I think I've forgotten the question entirely, as I usually do. What was it you were asking me? No, like the idea that art is being censored. Today yeah, art is being censored. Yes, it is. And I think it's, it, it's difficult. You Value creation. I think is a wonderful Buddhist concept. What value is the art creating? What is it teaching about ourselves? What does a book like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein teach about the human condition? What is, what am I saying about the human? I think every, every artist, when you pick up pen, paper, paintbrush, effectively you're saying, I think this is what I've learned. This is what I know. This is what I've imagined. This is, but this, I think the truth, truth is what makes great art, you know, about the human condition. If it enlightens, if it shine, enlightens, shine light upon. As, as you know, the human, if it helps us explore, if it helps us understand, that to me is 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 great art. And I think when you there are there will always be these voices. I think because, and I'm not picking out any particular religion at all, right? Uh, because there are many. It doesn't just have to be a, a religion. There are all sorts of circumstances in which basically people want to belittle and dominate and control other people for their own advantage. Um, that's nothing to do with politics. You know, that's just because we're human right. beings, basically. Um, in Buddhism, it's known as the world of animality. I'm stronger than you, therefore I'm going to punish you. Punish I'm going to take it out. Because you're, you're weaker than me, I'm going to victimize you. <gasps> I want, I'm weaker than him, therefore I'm going to cower before him or her. Um, so I, I think, yeah, yeah. Censorship, you have to be careful. You want, I think, kids today, God, so different to when I was growing up. You know, from what I understand, there is a real concern that I do not think it's healthy that young, when I say young, I mean prepubescent or early pubescent teenagers are exposed to porn and violent porn. I don't think this is a good idea. I don't think it teaches good values in terms of respecting other people. I'm constantly having to edit my, my language to try and make sure I'm clear about what it is I'm saying. You know, just kind of love each other, understand that everybody's different and that everyone has a different experience to yourself right. and accept that. One of the key phrases I came up with during the uh, pandemic when I was thinking about this, the show is that when we celebrate difference and do not fear it, then we create peace. When, when we celebrate difference and do not fear it, then we create peace. When you can really understand and you know, just think, oh my God, you're so different to me. I, I really have no understanding about your life or what it is, is you're trying to say. Um, then you just have to step back and say, okay, tell me a story. I, I, I wanna know your story because I, I don't understand. Um, I want to know more about you. I think this is, this is wonderful. I can say all of these things when I'm in an interview situation. 
And I know that I'll go out tomorrow and just think, oh, my idiot. You know, <laughs> this stuff does not come naturally to right. me, you know, and I think it doesn't come naturally to most people. You have to think about it. You have to really concentrate hard to respect other people and learn from other people. When it comes from your, when it comes to releasing your creativity, whether it's writing for Marvel Comics or doing a one man show or being in front of the camera or behind the camera, do you get the same release mentally and physically as you do for each medium? Or is each one provide something a little bit differently for you at that time when you needed it? Oh, really, really good question. It's different. I think it, it, it is different because Honestly, I think it has a lot to do with the number of people involved. Gotcha, right. When I'm writing, there's me and a keyboard, or actually usually in the first draft, it's me and a pencil, a propelling pencil and paper, and going, trying to get this out of my head before I all forget, oh, like, there's an idea. To shove that down over there. Or if I'm doing art, I'm just thinking, yeah, okay, how does that work? So it depends. Um when you're working with a group of people on film or theater, then it's a very different experience because it comes back to what I was saying earlier. It's much easier if you're able to talk it over with other people because it's a little bit more terrifying in the rehearsal room, I guess. I've not been in the rehearsal room for a long time, actually. Um, certainly before, since before the pandemic. It's because you're naked, you're, you're there. I mean, the great thing about being a writer on your own is you just you think, oh, that's crap. I'll just strike that out. And nobody will ever know when you're in a rehearsal room, you're there with the director, or it's like, oh, God, that is really scary. Um, so it just, you know, in terms of release and satisfaction and so on, it, yeah, it, it depends. It's different. I mean, there is nothing quite like applause. Um, I, because it, it really is a mark of a job well done. You know, you really are getting your homework marked by however many people. Um, and it's horrible when it, when it goes wrong. <laughs> it's just, it can be so soul destroying. Um, I remember it, being at school when I was in, uh, when I was 17 years old doing a play and literally getting through this, I'm watching people stand up and walk out. And I just thought, oh, wow, I've never seen that before. It was, it was not a proper theater, it was a school hall. So you could literally watch people standing up and walking out going, oh, it's rubbish. It's like, and just you knowing like, there's another hour and a half, there's another hour of this to go, okay. <laughs> Gonna do my best. Just don't look into the audience. <laughs> Just concentrate on what's going on on stage. I remember you know, that was a lesson I learned very young. You just have to keep on going, irrespective of what's going on out there. Um, it was tough, though. That was horrible. Uh, can I have a two-part question here? How mm. is it tough for you to, or is there a part of Kidski or the chatter that stays with you as you move forward through your life and career? And two, what I love about the Shatter is that you've kind of put this initiative out there to write more about this character with a backstory and mm. future stuff. It's like, why, what was it about that character that, that you wanted to be, be fleshed out more? This is really interesting. I think it kind of stems from part of my process as an actor is that I write, will usually write a backstory that's not in the script gets, I think as an actor, we all do, isn't, this is nothing unusual for actors. We, I'm sure we all do this in some form or another. It's like, you need to know why, what they were doing before they walked on ca onto camera and what they're expecting to happen whilst they're there and afterwards in the same way that if you walk into a, you know, even if that means walking into a room and not expect, not knowing what you expect. You, you've got to have some idea in your head as to what brought that character up until that point. Um, what I love with Kinski and, and Nightbreed, of course, is that Clive actually wrote backstories for all the after we'd done the film, funnily enough. Um, 
so that when I went on to do and was invited to write for Marvel Comics um, for the Nightbreed stuff and Hellraiser, I, 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 it springs out of that. I think I do love writing. I do love storytelling. And it just kind of, and it's just, I think particularly in terms of Hellraiser, because I had a couple of cracks at it, the most recent version, and the Prayers for Desire is the one that I'm most yep. happy with. Um, there were quite, you know, how does, spoilers for anyone who's not seen both films, <laughs> Chatterer is revealed as somebody, a particular sort of somebody. How did that person end up in hell? Um, was a question that just kept on coming back. And it's like, I want to work this out. I want to write something about this. I want to write about what my view of this is. And in doing that, then it becomes a meditation on love and sex and desire, which is obviously as human beings, what we're interested in. And it's obviously in the works of Clive Barker is something that he's incredibly interested right. in this. Um, so I don't think it's a surprise that I have ended up working with Clive so much because we share obviously through our friendship share many of the same concerns and interests as artists. So I think that's what kind of drove me on to do it. And I, the fact that people wanted to pay me money to do it. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll sure. go for that. that. That's always a great thing to you know, experience to have. You mentioned uh, earlier the conventions and stuff like that. Like, When's the last time you were with Doug or Clive or the cast mm. of Nightbreed? And like, how unique is it for you to see the, the, the impact that those roles and films have had on people? And like we kind of talked about earlier where you go to a convention and you'll see doctors, cops, uh, white, black, gay, straight, Ukrainian, Russian. There's every walk of life at these conventions. And they've all been positively affected by these characters and movies. And it's like for you to see that and maybe be next to Doug and kind of look at each other and be like, man, how cool is this that years later we still have this positive impact on people through our art? It, it is extraordinary and kind of hard. Obviously, it's not quantifiable. Tremendously grateful, honestly. I talked about applause being the ultimate marking yes. of one's homework. That, that is obviously very, very true, but also, you know, it's kind of getting you, it's kind of like getting an A plus every so often. <laughs> Do miss it. Um, talking to people, but also again, just listening to their stories. I am a great listener. I try my best to listen because I learn an awful lot more than I do by talking than by talking listening to people's stories and why it's important to them and how, you know, it's gone through phases over the years. I remember we went through a long period of people saying, oh yeah, first time I watched it was because my brother dared me $10 to watch it or my babysitter was, and I'm thinking your babysitter was encouraged. Um, you know, it, that went through, or, or yeah, no, I watched it up in my bedroom because we had cable and I could watch the films by myself. Oh no, I used to sit down with my parents. I used to sit with my mom and dad or there was, a, or it was yourself and an uncle or right. some, you know, family. And I think that's great. I mean, that's kind of how I came to horror movies in the first place as, a, as an aside, it was through my mom. Her in, I mean, the horror movies we're talking about were the black and white universal movies yeah. i'm talking about not, yeah 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 i'm watching talk about watching those on tv late at night in the 1970s i, I think it, it's wonderful i i mean it's so inspiring it is so inspiring that and i do find it amazing that and again i'm terribly terribly grateful that it's still true that people are Oh God, it's coming up for 40 years. It's crazy. <laughs> we, re we passed the 35th anniversary, 35 years 
this year, the release of Hellraiser. So it's not that long before we hit the 40th anniversary of Hellraiser. And that's phenomenal. That's amazing. And I, I do love the fact that it's new audiences and it's, it's parents telling their children, oh, by the way, you might find this kind of cool. I, you know, I think that's extraordinary. So I get to meet people of all ages. I mean, I remember going through, went through one period where Chatterer was, or Chatterbox, as they he tended to be known, was very popular amongst boys. I mean, like eight-year-old, nine-year-old, 10-year-old boys. I mean, a few of them <laughs> at conventions, as I was thinking. We did not make this movie for people your age, but yeah, you, it's obviously through your parents. You're not, right? they're obviously here. You're not here by yourself. Um, it's, it's extraordinary. Absolutely amazing. I love that even in this day and age, someone like Clyde Barker, uh, David Cronenberg, all these prolific, Stephen King, all these people, mm. authors in the horror genre, whether whatever art form it is, they're still push to still create and still do something different like yourself mm. like there's no resting on the laurels and it's like how do you kind of keep doing i mean you still have your passion for what you do and for what you represent and your brand and how you want to keep pushing yourself but for, there, i mean there's people out there that will win one championship which is amazing but it'd be like i'm done or hey i wrote one book or i wrote one book of poems or i i created this one painting and i'm happy not to take away from those people, but what mm. drives you to release more poems, to do one more one man shows, like to keep directing, keep writing, like what pushes you to keep being that, that keep, keep moving forward? It's it's the it's the desire to tell stories, and the, the fact that my brain is this sizzling thing of like images or ideas or phrases or things that I learn. I've always said that, you know, youth is nothing to do with age. Obviously, it has a lot to do with, with physical age in terms of energy levels. But having a youthful attitude, to, in my mind, means curiosity, wanting to learn more. I talked about meeting new people and, and, right. and really trying to do my best to not be scared of people and just try and really listen to people's stories just insatiable curiosity um, and learning more. I, I know how little I know uh, and how much I have to learn. I recently became really active in um, the Green Party over here. In fact, we just finished doing in fact, That's mostly what I've been spending the last three months. Uh, it really intensely um, local ele elections because I do care about the planet and yeah. ecology and you know we've got to sort this shit out folks yes. we've really got <laughs> to do <laughs> and i think that has something funnily enough i think it has a lot to do with the fact that i was i watched the moon landing on television Crazy. live i am of that generation i am of the generation that saw the photograph on the front pages of the newspapers is known as the blue marble it's earth from the moon and you just and it was really the first time that anyone had actually seen a photograph of this and you realize just how small this planet is how much we are all inter interdependent upon one another um Again, I've lost the question because I've gone off into one of my... <laughs> no, you you answer because we were talking about the idea that how do you keep pushing yourself to keep... Yeah, I, I, I think it, so. Th this all comes back to this insatiable curiosity and caring about where we are and, and so on. I, it's about telling somebody... I want to say Mandelbrot. I've got his name wrong. There's a gentleman, there's a, a, a reporter who reports on these things. And he said, it's about telling a story. To be able to communicate about the 
eco ecological crisis we're going through at the moment. You've got to be able to tell a story to make people understand, to help. You can't make somebody understand anything if they choose not to. Um, but to show, I think, so that's a lot of what goes through my mind at the moment. But also, a lot of what goes through my mind at the moment in terms of stories is about um, technology. It's about impossible moral choices. It's a story I've been thinking about for at least two or three years, and I just can't quite nail how I'm going to do it and make this work. And it requires an awful lot of research for a short story because it's a historical <laughs> short yeah. story. Um, and the, I'm not sure about the payoff, but it's like, that is kind of what it is as far as I'm concerned. I just have these things going on in my head. It's the, the urge to communicate, as one of my teachers said at drama school. It's just this tremendous need to try and tell stories while you can, because I think that human beings are creatures of story. Um, are you familiar with the works of Terry Pratchett? I'm familiar, but I'm not really versed really much. Uh, okay, okay. I well, know the they, name, but I know the face. You know the name and yeah. Discworld and the yes. whole like. I I I'm a huge, huge fan of Terry Pratchett, and he's who's written at least two or three books all around the theme of the fact the power of stories, and because stories is how we understand the world. You know, yeah, I, as I talked about earlier on about putting people into categories and boxes because it just helps us understand, Try, you know, we understand patterns. It's why it's really easy to see the image of a face in a piece of toast because our brain is hardwired to recognize patterns because it's a self-defense mechanism. Uh, and so on. So yeah, the, the stories. And I'm, it's cool you brought that up because, like, growing up, my mom's side of the family, they're all dairy farmers up in Western New York, and generations coming over and being farmers, and all this stuff. It's growing up as a kid, even now, like when we started do a bonfire, we listen to our grandmother, our uncles, the older generation tell stories about different people growing up, like what it was like when the Amish first moved in, or what what the real what wars were back then or what the great depression was like all this stuff where it's like these stories like who's going to be the people that keeps telling these stories or is it on our generation and when i say our i mean i look at myself and it's like i have two younger sisters and i remember when you talked about the newspaper when princess diana died i remember, i still mm -hmm. have that that picture on my paper i still have when 9 11 towers happened yeah. there's certain events like that but then the, the generation after me, I'm like, you guys have Will Smith slapping Chris Rock on your papers. You have no one that's sharing these stories. It's all TikTok. It's all garbage. And it's like, where's the history of the story? Who is going to be telling these stories that are going to last generations and not five minutes and just burn out? And it's, I don't know, it just, it just makes me so frustrating because the power of stories and just putting it out there. Yeah, I it's, I think you raise a couple of really, really interesting things. I think it's easy for people who are really not involved in TikTok and, and, and so on, just to say. And yet we have through TikTok, we have a guy who sang three shanties on TikTok. And, and I love it. Was a, <laughs> oh, was, was a postman and gave up his job and now recording because he brought this whole genre of music back because it's all, you know, what you have to remember is, yeah, that we we'll talk about the 19th, but it's just a handful of newspapers owned by an even smaller number of right. people. Um, again, I was walking, working, uh, watching something the other day about the fact that Elon Musk buying Twitter is huge in terms of one man's influence upon the world. People talk about Rupert Murdoch and his yes. evil empire of papers yeah. and the right yeah. wing and Fox News. It's nothing. Drop in the ocean. When you think that Elon Musk can just say and let in who he wants and kick out who he wants and so on. And I, I think the, the real challenge there for lawmakers is to really, really wake up 
and understand the power of these things. Um, I think the stories are there. I think YouTube is amazing. I spend far too yes. much of my time watching yes. YouTube. I do very definitely find people who tell me, and there's a guy called Andrew Millison, who, um, Millison, Millison, who does a, a channel and he talks about a thing called permaculture, the idea of rain harvesting. And he reports on what they're doing in an India to turn barren landscape into highly productive farmland and how this means that the communities who own that farmland no longer have to travel in the city when the drought comes because they're managing the water and they're keeping the water because of the way that they basically dig ditches and little barriers and they literally harvest rainwater and they keep it and it goes into the soil and it comes there are so many um the biggest little farm is a is a wonderful documentary about a farm in california about it's like yeah we're going to go back to nature but manage nature and we're going to yeah. you know there are so many there is a lot of hope out there there are a lot of springs so i think it's hard to find with all the noise there is so much noise um, which is why, honestly, I don't really get onto Facebook that much. Don't really go onto Twitter. I tend to do hit and run posting. I think yeah, I like this. Smart. I'll go post that, and I'm probably not going to worry about response. It's, you know, I'm terrible. I'm just really, really bad at social media from these perspectives. Um, and then, of course, I'm, now that I'm doing, I mentioned I, uh, I am monsters in the filming. Of course, we're going to start promoting that, and that means I'm going to have to get back onto social media properly and engage with people because I want them to see the film when it's released or whatever happens to it. And it's one of those things too where, I mean, with technology, we're able to do this. I mean, mm. like you, I, I try to get away from the politics of, or not necessarily the politics, but the, the name calling and the diatribe out there where you're just like, just be a good person, right? And just take out, just be nice to each other. So what if you think differently? That's okay. Those are the type of people I want to associate myself with. I find that mm. social media... I mean, if you want to promote a movie or a book or a book of poems or a story, like it's necessary evil. I'm okay with it that way. But before I let you go, mm. and this has been obviously, this is one of my favorite episodes I've ever recorded. Like, what type it, of projects? I mean, obviously, we know I am monsters recording, but mm. if people want to check out appearances, will those start up again or new works and stuff like that? Do you want them to go to your website? Like, how do you want them yeah. to reach out to you and kind of follow up to what you're doing? Yeah. I think go to the website. As I say, I'm really bad at Facebook. I think you're going to find me more there and probably mostly Facebook, Twitter. Really should do something with Instagram. Um, <laughs> really should do these things and we'll be doing more. Website, if you want to find stuff, there's nothing up there yet because we, I don't really, as I say, it's been announced and I'm quite happy for people to know because it's out there in the world that I'm working on this. Once we've actually started filming, then we will start releasing. I think, you know, this is one of the reasons, one of the things, one of the many things I'm going to have to talk about the production meeting later this evening. Okay, so how are we going to release stuff yeah. uh, into the world and just let people know what's going on and so on? And, and there's all sorts of really interesting conversations happening about what might be happening. In terms of appearances, uh nothing concrete at the moment i wish it'd be very nice if there was did uh, you know they tend to happen when they happen and then the promoter will say yeah we've got these com these guys coming across and then that i'll know well i can only i can only uh, imagine what's the 40th anniversary of hellraiser hits that year for you is going to be monumental yeah that's like, what the I'm point really where it's saying. like hey stop calling me i want to enjoy uh <laughs> I want oh, to no, I... breakfast in bed for just once in my house. <laughs> I'll probably say, no, please carry on calling. Because you're always scared they're going to stop calling. Yeah. <laughs> the actor's thing is always like, if I, say, if I say no, will they just suddenly stop calling? Um, it was why you tend to say, yeah, um, I, I will find time at some point to get back to you. I just won't 
promise when it may take you know it takes me a long time to get around to a lot of things sometimes depending on what else is going on at the time right but yeah and and sir thank you very much indeed this has been you know a fun fun interview really interesting interview as far as i'm awesome concerned. well uh thank you nicholas for everything and uh wish you all the success and love and uh we'll have to do it again sometime thank you very much indeed how's it going everyone john here the host of spear talk you might not know this, but before I record an episode, I like to break a sweat. And I do that using the Chop Fit. Over the course of the past year, the Chop Fit has allowed me to lose weight, tone up my body, and feel even more amazing about myself. A feeling that you should all feel about yourself as well. If you use this code, SPEARCHOP10, you get $10 off your order. Once again, use code SPEARCHOP10 for $10 off your Chop Fit order. It'll change your life. Thank you.